Disenchantment is Matt Groening's new animation series on Netflix, and it's trying to do for fantasy what Futurama was already doing for science fiction. However, the response of the critics and fans has been kinda meh. Disenchantment currently only has a 63% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, and a lot of critics use the disenchantment as being a disappointment pun a lot. I want to discover with you what is wrong with it and how can we fix it so we can make our own animation and our own stories better. Let's have a look at Disenchantment, the animation and the story. Discussing mistakes in art and comedy is always a bit problematic because, you know, what might be funny to me, might not be funny to you, and some of these things are subjective. Obviously, there are films and movies and stories that work really good, and we can try to take a little bit of what works good in other series and in other stories and put it into the stuff that doesn't work so well in Disenchantment. We're going to talk about the show in its entirety. I will take stuff from all episodes, so if you still want to enjoy uh, the series, uh, then you should probably watch it first. And also, if you want to know everything that I'm talking about, of course, it helps a lot if you have seen it. Here's just a quick summary for these people who have no idea what the show is about. Disenchantment is following Princess Tia Bini, or Bean for short, and she has an overprotective father, the king, who doesn't let her explore the world and find boys or men to have relationship with. No, he has his own plans of how he wants uh, the princess to be, but Bean is meeting her personal demon Lucy and an elf who left the elf country because he was being tired of being happy all the time and they are getting thrown into a bunch of different situations. One of them being that the blood of Elfo the Elf is one of the ingredients of the elixir of life that the king would like to have. First, let's have a look at the stories of Disenchantment. And this is the area where I think the show could improve the most. It already has a bunch of interesting ingredients, bunch of interesting puzzle pieces, but in the current form of the show, it doesn't all quite come together. The biggest problem is that the formula of the show isn't clear. Most TV shows, most TV series have some kind of, of fixed ingredients that we love seeing in every episode. And now some shows have that more than others. There are shows that have a villain of the week format where there's always a villain being introduced and then the heroes are fighting them. That's a very, very static formula. And then there are others which just have like similar themes or just the way that they present certain topics is always the same, but there's something to to cling on, something that we can expect from this show. And this is the biggest problem here. In Disenchantment, some episodes are an adventure, others are more of a parody, and other episodes, again, are more like situational comedy, with the cast of the characters just having a task in the village um, that they have to solve. And there are some strong ones and some weak episodes for, for each of them. Um, most people probably agree that the adventure episodes at the beginning and the end are the strongest. And that kind of makes me wonder, why does it start out as an adventure, then goes to like situation stories in the kingdom, and then it goes back to adventure? I, I, I wonder how it happened that this show developed that way, because 
it, it, it kind of also deprives the audience of something. Like if you watch the first two episodes and you're kind of like, okay, this is this is going to be characters going on quests. That makes sense because, you know, in fantasy, characters go on quests. And then the next episode, the most of the season is just staying in the kingdom um, with a few exceptions. It's kind of disappointing. It's kind of you, you are not given what you're promised. And that is probably the the huge problem here it it promises to be all these things but it ends up being too little of all of these things like our our want for situational comedy is not fully fulfilled our want for parody is not fully fulfilled and there is not enough adventure for my taste Maybe the other thing that they're also uh, being a little messy about is if they are being a horizontal or a vertical series. And what that means is horizontal um, is when a show always resets after an episode. Uh, and vertical would be if the, the show's episodes are building on each other. And again, in the beginning with the adventure episodes, it feels like it's it's building up to something. It's building to development, and then it's kind of meh if it's just if it's just uh, dips into that part where a lot of episodes are uh, are not advancing the plot. Nowadays, I feel like we are used more and more to very very long stories, to series where the episodes build on top of each other, and Matt Groening. Uh, and, and, and the other filmmakers even said in an interview that they wanted to use this series to tell a huge story, but it, it, it kind of feels like they didn't go through with that. But, you know, what is the lesson here? What is the advice for you and your story? Now, I would say the solution is explore your material, explore your series in scripts and animatics. You can try to write an adventure episode, you can try to write a parody and a sitcom episode with the same characters, but then you should see what you like the most, what the audience like the most, and then stick to one of these forms. This way you can give your audience more of what they actually want to see and you can develop the part of the series that is actually the most interesting the animation you know with us being an animation channel we of course need to have a look of what is good what can be improved here and of course this is also a little bit mean because i know that these series are produced on like huge budget constraints and um yeah, maybe maybe the people aren't paid very well and all this stuff and then you just you just try to get it done. I get that, but you know, for us as animators, I want to know if we make an uh, an a TV series, what can we pay attention to? What is something that can make our animation look better and more fluent at relatively little cost? One thing that I always saw while watching it was Lucy's tail because Lucy's tail is so big it highlights animation mistakes so clearly and so often that we just need to have a closer look at, at the things that I constantly saw and that were driving me furious. So I picked a scene where I thought that this was very clearly visible um, let me switch off my drawings at first. And this is something that I am pointing out in Lucy, but it is also happening in a lot of other motions for other characters. But in Lucy, you just see it so well because of the tail. And uh, yeah, here's, here's the animation, how it looks. And the points that I am bothered by is when he turns, the tail just doesn't settle, doesn't overshoot. The frame before the tail stops is that one. And that is a huge distance. Um, there 
is that tail end and in the next frame it's over here and then just staying there with no overshoot, nothing. But think about it, if something was that fast that in one frame it was here and in that frame it is over there, it should still have momentum left. It should still have speed left. And the um, best way to take out speed of an object um, relatively believable with very little frames is by doing a simple overshoot. That is why my suggestion for this situation would be to before before his tail settles in that position have a frame where it is almost that exact same drawing but it's overshot a little bit. Um, then another thing that I was wanted to improve is um, because when you move an object like a tail uh, the rules of follow through apply meaning that some elements are leading uh, and some elements are lagging behind and the elements that lag behind are usually at the end of the chain so his tail tip should actually stay almost in place when the rest of his tail is already moving do you see that do you see that that i felt like makes the the start of the motion a lot, make a lot more sense to me because the back of his tail is leading and then the tip of the tail is following. And this is how it looks when you play it. If you want to make this even better and you have a little bit of an animation budget, what you could do is put more eases. Whenever you can put in more eases, for example, at the beginning here, you could have put two more frames of the, the or maybe yeah, one more frame would already be enough of the tail starting to move. And then here, when the, the tail reaches the end position, it, there could have been like a little ease, you know, like a little like that, maybe even a little closer, just to add a little bit of an extra, uh, extra softness. And then the other thing that I noticed um, is that it has a lot of stuff on once where I don't quite understand why it is on once. If somebody knows, maybe maybe you can tell me. I, I you know when a character is turning like this, why can't he just turn a couple frames longer? And you see that this is on twos. Now it's on once. Now these frames are one new frame every time. And yeah, and then it's on twos again. In my draw over, I put everything on twos and I feel that also contributed to the impression of it being a lot smoother. What I noticed in Bean's head turn here is that it's very robotic. You see, there's no arc. She's just turning like a stiff robot. There's no arc, there's no follow through and overshoot in her hair. So what would I do to improve this? I added Again, it's the same amount of drawings. I think it's even one drawing less, but I added a dip down. You see that the nose is being dipped down and now the chin is making this arc. And that makes a huge difference. That makes any motion so much better. If you use the breakdown to define the motion and make it make it more clear, make it have arcs, make it more interesting, add something to it that explains what exactly is happening, that there's weight in the head that is causing her head to dip down when she wants to move it. Like that. And then you see the, the other guy, the wizard is doing the same thing. This is just, you know, somebody was, was drawing in betweens that was painting by numbers. It really, it really, you, you still have to draw the, the drawing. You have to draw the same amount of drawings. Why don't you just draw a drawing that is like this? You know, what do you lose? You still have to draw the same amount of drawings. So you might as well uh, do it the right way and use, use arcs, use dips in your head turn and stuff like that. Now for the jump here that Lucy is doing, again, it is switching to once on the way down 
and I don't think it should because it, it just looks if you look at it it just looks too fast like he's he's just gone there's nothing elegant or smooth about this and this is by the way not a special animation style that the character has this is happening on other characters too um so what i did is i just kept him up there a little longer because you know if you remember the bouncing ball the moment the bouncing ball jumps up let's say here's the ground it comes up and then you know the spacings get closer and closer and closer like that and this is something that we could also put in to lucy's jump like those two frames you see the the frames I added, they are close together. They are on twos, so he's in the air longer. And then when he's coming down, this is still a bigger distance, but it's not as big as it is in the original animation. And then this last distance is the biggest one. So we have a nice easing going on, and we see him just a little longer when he jumps up. This also gives us the nice opportunity to do some follow through on the arms. Uh, as you can see here, the arms are just dipping down from the force. This is also what the animator did here, really nice. And then the cool thing that we can do here is because he's staying in the air almost at the same spot, we can lift his arms up a little. That looks really nice. That makes the animation more interesting. And then he's coming down and the, the arms are slowly going in the upwards position. Maybe we could even put them like that. Um, and this gives you a lot smoother, a lot more clearer animation where you don't feel like it's going too fast and you actually have time to see to see Lucy in the air coming down and his tail feels more elegant that way too. And again, I'm using the, f the same amount of frames. Um, I hope this gave you some ideas what you can do to boost the quality of your own animation with the same amount of frames that it would take to make a bad animation. So what is there to say about the cinematography of Disenchantment? And it is a lot like Futurama and The Simpsons in that the camera angles are usually, you know, it is a little theater-like. You see Oftentimes you see the entire character, uh, it's a bit bit further away um, and it, it, it feels a little bit more like a, like a theater a bit, um, which usually fits with the, with the satire humor of Matt Grunning, I think very, very well, but it becomes painfully obvious in action scenes. Like in some action scenes in Disenchantment, we just zoomed out really far and the characters are in their walk cycle and then it switches uh, and then it's walk cycles from another direction but it's all like not pulling you in it's not cinematography action that is with the characters um, in contrast for example here is a scene from Voltron where we get really close we have all these different angles and then the 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 some of the motions are not just the walk cycle it's like really trying to dodging stuff and if they're using walk cycles it's not that painfully obvious uh, like it is in this enchantment Again, the show needs to decide what it wants to be. Does it want to be more like a theater sitcom thing? Fine, that can be great, do it. Does it want to have funny action scenes? Then you need to take more of that cinema language that we are used to and that we like. Also, they are using some 3D sometimes for the backgrounds. Uh, we are already used to that from Futurama too and in Futurama, I thought it, always thought it was really cool. Like whenever it was something 3D, I was like, oh, whoa, this is 3D in a 2D show. So amazing. But I feel like this novelty effect has worn off in me. And whenever I see it just randomly, just 
turning around a tower. I'm like, what is the purpose of this? You could have just shown a still image of the tower. It would still have made sense production wise to build the castle in 3D because then you can generate more backgrounds relatively quickly. But you know, usually it doesn't add much to just turn the, the camera a little bit. Um, and in, in, in fact, in the last episode, I think, I it, it sometimes even pulled me out of the um I wanted to know what was going on between Bean uh, between Bean and her mother but then there was like this 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 spinning tower in between and I, I really didn't need it I wanted to get back to the characters as fast as possible I knew they were in the tower so, so just show me a picture of the tower and yeah what is the lesson here don't move the camera if you don't have a reason it's always a good lesson and, uh, but generally it can make a lot of sense to produce 3D assets for a 2D show because you can generate different camera angles very quickly and, and, and reuse this, this, this 3, 3D model many times. Yeah, so I'm not completely against it. I just felt like it wasn't used right. It was maybe a bit overused. Next up, let's have a look at how they do character development and the setup in Disenchantment. Um, well, one of the things that kind of stood out to me pretty early on it, that it felt to me like Bean was Leela, Alpha was Fry, and Lucy was Bender from Futurama. This is not true in all episodes. I mean, they do show some other character traits, but it is kind of interesting how similar those characters are and this is not necessarily a bad thing i feel like a lot of filmmakers and storytellers they have favorite character types favorite story types what i think is actually problematic is that there were a bunch of stale setups in the episodes that make um the stories kind of predictable for example, it starts off with this classical wedding plot. A, a woman gets forced to marry a man that she doesn't love. That's a thing that we have seen like a thousand times before. And I know in the end they try to, to, to push it to like absurd e extremes and put some craziness into that. But I feel like that all comes up too late. Like when the episode starts and I dev I, I realize it's a, oh it's a wedding plot hmm I don't know it it doesn't hook me as much as it could I guess um, which isn't to say that you should always avoid these these plots for example I felt like the um, the Disney feature film uh, Pixar feature film Coco always has a, uh, also had a very very stale setup something that felt very predictable and very like oh um, i've seen this before but then how how the, the extents that they go and the direction that they take it is refreshingly epic and big and new and you can take a, a concept that we have seen before and make something interesting out of it but it just feels like um like it isn't happening in disenchantment uh, there's also the the uh, diplomacy episode where Bean becomes an ambassador and you just know right from the beginning that she is going to screw it up and you know that the moment they are in the bar it's clear yeah she will get drunk and she will she will screw it up and that kind of made it a little i don't know n not interesting to watch. And the biggest problem that I have here is with Bean, the main character, that I I I feel like the ingredients are there to relate to her a lot. You know, she is neglected by her father, her father uh, remarried, she has a stepmom, uh, her mom died and she doesn't know exactly what happened there. And those are things that you can make very very strong stuff out of but it always feels like that bean was only telling us that she suffers she was always complaining about her father um you know there are these parts where she 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 wishes that the the mom would be back but 
we don't really see her being emotional about it like she tells us those things but we don't see her being being affected emotionally and also with the relationship to her father um she always tells us that she's bothered by her father's control but she already is doing everything she wants like she's always getting out of the castle with no problem and i know she would like to have a better relationship with her father and all that but you know it doesn't seem that bad if she can technically leave at any time if she already is doing all these things that she likes to do um that kind of let leaves a lot of stuff on the table and then I really don't like characters getting drunk or getting high. I don't feel like it's a clever joke. I don't feel like it's, I don't know. It's, it, it can be a cheap plot device to get the characters out somewhere doing something stupid. But then half of the time her being drunk is not actually being played out. Like we don't, except for in the diplomacy episode, we don't see her acting actually drunk the moment they leave the bar she seems to be sober and just doing stupid things because she is her character um and the moment that i realized that you can do this differently in a brilliant way was actually when i was watching netflix series maniac it's a live action series uh, but in one of the later episodes it's a serious, it's a crazy series that's going through like dream sequences and it also has a fantasy dream where oh, one of the characters is a drunk elf and she reminded me a lot of Bean but she is actually acting drunk and she's forced to fight while being drunk and it's just hilarious and in in Maniac, she's not given many lines because she's only a character that appears in two episodes. But whenever she says something, whenever she does something, it, it characterizes her in a way. For example, when during the fight, the bottle that she keeps her alcohol in is hit, it sets her into a rage. And of course, the lines that she says after she defeated the attacker. My greatest triumphs always go unwitnessed. <sighs> all in all, what I think could have solved a lot of the problems that Disenchantment has is to maybe show how the conflicts begin, start earlier. I think it would have been interesting to see Bean's reaction when her father told her that she uh, she gets a stepmom that he wants to to remarry like I think it would have in, been interesting to see that relationship between the father and the daughter crumble and go downhill like to get to that place and that could have maybe given us some um, some very serious emotional s scenes of being feeling abandoned and I know that sounds very dramatic, but I feel, I really feel like you could do this in a way that is both seriously dramatic at times, but also incredibly comedic and fun because tragedy and comedy are really, really close together. A little postscriptum I recorded a day later. I definitely don't want you to think that you need to start like super early with the childhood of your protagonist. Definitely start your story as late as possible but I was miss what I was missing in disenchantment is stuff actually developing into a problem that then needs to be solved and that is usually done during the exposition of a story you know that that a problem starts that a situation goes becomes so bad that it can no longer be ignored that something has to be done about it and I was missing these kinds of development Men's mostly on the emotional level like sure there are situations appearing but I, I, I want to see more how a character gets forced into things emotionally and how things get worse for a character emotionally because there's not of not a lot of these things in there I feel like we don't really get a lot of this loneliness that she has like I feel like that element is there hovering over over everything 
but it, it's never really played out um, that even if she is with a man it's not the right one and she's always feeling lonely and maybe it could have it, it could have taken some time for that and even dragged it out that she meets Elfo and Lucy like one or two episodes later to really see the contrast. And then there's Elfo. I read many times that people were annoyed by this character. And personally, I, I, I liked him okay. I actually really loved the setup of a happy elf being sick and tired of being happy, wanting to be unhappy. I thought that was just a, a clear and interesting concept. Unfortunately, they abandoned that uh, pretty early on for like a generic, he has a crush on the beautiful girl plot, which we have seen a million times before. And I don't know, they use it to some good extents in the episode with the, with the giant lady, but I just felt like it wasn't really adding anything that was necessary to their relationship or that was something new, something that got me excited about these characters. The thing with Lucy is that I really like the character. I like the character design. Uh, I like many of the lines that he says. I like that he's kind of this, this classical devil character, but I feel like story-wise, setup-wise, they didn't use him to the full extent. One very obvious thing that they leave on the table is that Lucy could have changed Bean's world. Bean could have been a boring princess in the beginning and then because of Lucy, she could have turned into this out of control princess. I don't know, I feel like this setup is so obvious that the filmmakers must have talked about this and deliberately decided to not do that, to have Bean already be out of control and to give her a demon whose task it is to make her out of control. But what is that supposed to be? Is that supposed to be a joke? Am I supposed to find that funny that the demon's work is already kind of done with her. I mean, she, Lucy sometimes pushes the limits on how out of control Bean's, uh, Bean goes, but it feels like they could have made some interesting stories of, you know, the princess going more and more corrupt over time. At first I thought they didn't want to do that because they wanted to do it with Elfo. They wanted to, to have Elfo to be the happy, sane, normal character and then take him darker and darker. But he also is like completely corrupt after, after two or three episodes. He already is almost as bad as Lucy and he's kind of like, I don't know, there's, there's Bean in the middle and there's Lucy being really evil and Elfo just being, I don't know, not that good, but I feel like this setup could have been a lot clearer. There are some episodes where this is very clear. For example, in the diplomacy episode where um, Lucy is trying to get her to drink and Elfo is trying to stop her. That's a setup where they clearly have a person in the middle and then we have an angel and a devil. But they don't do this consistently and they don't do this to a really, really interesting and surprising extent. I have to say though that I really like the voice actors. The way they say lines really gives texture and and and, and some deepness to it. For example, just listen to this. When in the course of human events. No, that's stupid. Stupid. Love is oh my gosh, I can't do this. I'm not I'm never gonna be able to do this. I've known a lot of writers, most of them go to hell. And the one surefire way to unleash your creative juice is with creative juice. I just love the delivery that the, the two actors are doing there, really great. One thing that really bothered me in the setups is that they set up a lot of the things very, very late. Bean's half-brother is introduced when he's needed. Like in the first episodes, we don't know that he has, that she has a half-brother and then when it, it's needed for the diplomacy episode, there he is and he gets a lot of lines and that kind of, I don't know, it, it feels weird in a, in a serious 
when you only introduce stuff right before you need it. The other thing was that crystal ball that later is used a lot, but it gets introduced halfway in the season. In a lot of the early episodes, if the characters knew that such a thing exists, they also would have asked it for advice. So it's it's kind of weird that you have these episodes with characters having problems not using the crystal ball, and then after half of the series, they have uh, problems and now use the crystal ball, ask the crystal ball. I think it can be kind of fun if you if you introduce us uh, like casually in one episode, and maybe use it like for a joke or like a little a little story element, and then. Uh, gradually incre increase the importance for what it was actually needed. Then what I wanted to see a lot more of were actual consequences to things that happened. One of the most uh, weird things to me was when in the diplomacy episode the neighbor country declares war. They declare war. They are at war now. And then in the next episode, it's like everything is normal. Maybe that was supposed to be a joke, but I feel like you could have made an even more interesting joke out of it with maybe, you know, the people in the castle still having their normal life, but the normal people suffering and being at war. Like that could have been something interesting with a little bit of a satirical touch. And sometimes there are consequences that are just the most meaningless things. like. The uh, in one episode, the witch's gingerbread house burns down, and then in another episode, some other characters revisit the house and it is burned down. I thought that was an interesting touch, but that is nothing that makes an episode actually um, that makes an emotional connection, that makes emotional stakes. It's just I'm like, oh, I burned down, cool, but. In, in, in areas where I was wishing for consequences, where I was wishing for development, the development was just not happening. I thought that was pretty weird. They also constantly hint at a big mystery being around those characters, but for the longest time, is not it's not leading anywhere. And I think what was a little bit annoying to me was that they just repeated the same hint over and over again. We saw the same two, three people observing them, uh, knowing about Lucy, but you know, they're just observing them and every other episode or every three episodes, there was just a reminder, they are still observing them. And I know they did that in Futurama too. They hit stuff in Futurama and then later in later episodes, and later season, it suddenly was revealed to be important. But nowadays I feel like there are shows like Steven Universe or Gravity Falls that were so good at spreading out the mystery of giving us little breadcrumbs, but still making us feel like there were little bits of progress that I don't think it's acceptable anymore to just like wave, hey, there's a mystery here and um, and not actually have it have any consequences. So yeah, what is the solution to this? Make your breadcrumbs actually change something every now and then for the characters. And another addition from a day later, I remembered one thing that also bothered me was an inconsistency, namely that Lucy in the first episode can sit in fire and be fine, but then in the exorcism episode, the evil guy threatens to throw him into a volcano, into the lava, and I guess the volcano is a Lord of the Ring uh, reference, but why would that kill him if he is obviously some kind of fire demon? And I know you could argue, okay, he's okay with that fire, but after a certain point, it's too hot. But if you, if you create storytelling rules, it's more about how the rules feel. And for me, the rule I felt was Lucy is a fire demon. He's okay with fire. You can easily circumvent that and not by explaining like this is a super hot volcano that will kill you, but 
Uh, let's say the evil dude could have done something, like he could have poured something into the volcano and, and the lava turned purple or something like this. This would tell us, without any dialogue or like actual information, that something deadly happened to this lava and this lava is now different and kill demons. I, I think that would have been nice to avoid the inconsistency. I just feel some more clearly set out rules for what can and cannot happen would help us. Now, obviously, a big part of this enchantment is the humor. And we also need to talk about why some jokes in this enchantment work better than others. And that is usually something that you should try to get right during your animatics. Time your animation, time your story, watch it, watch it with friends, watch it with colleagues, with other people, and try to see if they are laughing at the right spot, you know, and if they're not, you need to change something, maybe use a completely different joke, cut the joke out, or just try to make the timing uh, better. Usually like a little bit of a pause can go a long way, but there's also something awkward if you make a pause too long, then it feels like you're expecting the audience to laugh, but that can be really sad if your audience isn't laughing. But I have to say the jokes that I liked the most in this enchantment were the jokes that were very visual. There was a, an amazing joke right in the in the first episode where uh, Elfo is meeting that, that troll or giant or whatever it is in, in that war sequence and he's putting a dagger into his eye and I thought it was just brilliant when the 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 troll just randomly like a, a lot of miles away from where they first met when he suddenly reappears that was just funny and that was a brilliant joke told without any words please only use words when they're absolutely necessary and there are moments where they're doing it perfectly for example the the pig's blood scene where uh, they're trying to squeeze the elf blood out of elfo because it has magical components uh, but there is not enough blood so the king wouldn't let them go and what they do is they hook up a pig to deliver a lot more blood and when they cut to the next day, you see this. I must admit, the quantity of blood exceeded my expectations. So, Elfo is free to go? Mmm, for now. Looks like I picked the wrong day to wear sandals. Was I the only one hoping for more blood? So what they do here, they perfectly work with visual comedy. And then when they don't get any further visually, they top it with some fun dialogue snippets. I really wish the show could have had more of these moments. There's a kind of visual comedy that I didn't uh, wish for in this series. Like what's up with these Scottish kilt jokes that are uh, happening, I don't know, two or three times in this series. Why are there Scottish people in this fantasy world? But yeah, um, another problem I had whenever I tried to be a bit of a parody, I feel like the parody elements were very superficial. Like, hey, here's the throne from Game of Thrones. But you know, this is not actually clever. This is not actually an inside joke. Okay, the, the scene with the throne were kind of funny, but everybody knows the throne from Game of Thrones, but it's not going beyond that. It's not going deeper into fantasy literature. It's not doing stuff that only insiders could know. I mean, the thing about good inside joke comedy is that um, ideally you do it in a way, a way that even if you don't know the inside information, you still find it funny. But if you know the inside information, you find it even funnier. Like that is the high art of making good parodies. And it's just not done a lot in this series. Although there is so much fantasy. You could have referenced a lot of the rings and the Hobbit a lot more than they do here. 
One thing that I really enjoyed though was whenever a little bit of satire was coming through in Disenchantment because it feels the most like Matt Groening's humor to me. This is something that I love in Futurama and The Simpsons. Well, I like war, but I wouldn't say I love it. Entertainment is just a tool that pacifies the masses and leads to the decay and ultimate collapse of civilization. Let's clap along. Then every now and then we are given a, an occasional meta element where the show is actually talking about the show, about world rules. Hey, you can't park on my lawn. My flaming arrow says I can. You've got a talking flaming arrow? What? No, it's just a regular arrow. Well, I'm sorry. Things get confusing in a world with occasional magic and curses. It also feels like stuff that we have seen before in Futurama and The Simpsons. And that is too bad because some TV series recently really pushed the boundary of, of what meta humor can do. I'm mostly thinking about Rick and Morty and Bojack Horseman. Both of them add an immense emotional complexity to their characters. They do crazy over the top stuff and they do humor that is pointing out stuff in the storytelling. But at the same time, there's this very believable emotional characterization for these characters. And as I talked about earl earlier, I am really missing some deepness in these characters that would be a great contrast for this kind of meta humor. There's one inconsistency that I found a little weird in comparison to Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty is using a lot of gore and so are parts of Disenchantment. In rare parts of Disenchantment, you see blood, you see arms cut off, you see, you see <laughs> gory stuff that I guess is supposed to feel satirical and humorous, but it's also it's also kind of adult you know this is something that we see in adult animation but then the characters never curse like this is giving me a weird discrepancy of oh we want to be an adult show that's why we put some gore in there but um, yeah we don't we don't want to go that curse word route this is especially obvious because there are shows that go all in like Rick and Morty and it feels kind of weird if you only go half a step in and personally I, I wouldn't have missed it if they didn't do the gory stuff like just that to me it would have fit more if they wouldn't have done the gory stuff because then it was a more a more pulled back a more classic kind of comedy um, and then I wouldn't have compared it as much to those to those brilliant meta shows that are doing the gore and the meta humor a lot better than disenchantment does what is the lesson in here well once again pick one tone and then go with it if you want to do satire great do a lot of satire make every a sentence that a character says revealing and pointy and, and 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 showing something about human nature if you want to do gory dirty dark humor stuff do more of it do more jokes like that um and yeah personally i wish they would pick one of those directions and and go more in that direction what do you think of disenchantment did you love it did you hate it um, please discuss anything in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Keep on animating and I talk to you later.